for many of us, we are a day and a half away from the first extended break uh, since the beginning of the school year. And I know for many of us, uh, we're very much looking forward to that and feeling the need for that. My name is Don Taylor, and this is uh, episode three of the eighth season of the Middle Grades Collaborative uh, Conversations. Um, we have folks who uh, are will be coming in a little bit later, but this afternoon's conversation is focusing on strategies for building relationships, healing, and equity-centered trauma-informed education. I'm uh, getting that from the title of Alex Chevron Vanette's uh, book that um, is a, a, very, a great read on the topic. And before we get into our discussion and before our uh, co-conversationalists introduce themselves, uh, I just want to thank the Middle Grades Collaborative uh, for supporting this work. And uh, at, at the time, right now, as uh, one of our contributors just noted, uh, Meg O'Donnell said, it seems that this is a subject that is more timely than ever. Uh, but let's get going. Uh, Katie and Meg, if you want to introduce yourself, that would be great. So hi, I'm Katie Farber. I'm an assistant professor at St. Michael's College and always happy to be here and be part of these discussions. Hi there, I'm Meg O'Donnell. I teach humanities uh, to seventh and eighth graders at Shelburne Community School. All right, thank you. And before we actually get into the topic, uh, maybe if we could just check in um, and check in with each of our uh, contributors and see how is it going right now? How are you feeling? And how has this year uh, presented challenges or surprises uh, to you? And we'll start with Katie and then Meg. Well, I am about to do um, a presentation after this class of about, I don't know, 50 people or so, and then one tomorrow morning. So I'm feeling a little bit um, jangly <laughs> right now coming in from class. Um, so it's, I always appreciate when we can give our students that chance to get settled because how many times do they come in feeling, you know, jangly from whatever was just happening before or for what they were about, what they're about to do next. Um, and then Don, you said your other, your other question was, it was a check-in and then it was, did I what miss? is something that you've mm -hmm. been surprised by or oh. challenged by, uh, maybe this year kind of as. I don't know even what to title it, but after sort of three pandemic years, this was supposedly a quote return to normal. Yes. And I, and I feel like it's really very clear to me that we have no normal, um, that, that mental health and wellness um, is still really at the forefront of the work, um, working with undergraduate students, working with fifth graders. It's still really just crucial in allowing people the space to be, you know, flexible and try to get what they need. Um, the, the same issues um, are presenting themselves, you know, from early and mid pandemic and, um, and just call for more flexibility and more services. Thank you very much, uh, Meg. Uh, I'm, Meg might be uh, dealing with some issues right now. Well, Katie, you know, as someone uh, you're seeing uh, some of those same issues at the uh, at the collegiate level in your role now, and I don't know if you still get back into the fifth grade classroom or or in your new role. But one of the things that I'm kind of trying to figure out is the balance between um, a sort of accountability, maybe I think that uh, and accountability, and then figuring out how to build those relationships with kids, but also how to um, strike an even keel. And, um, and, and I think that's been one of the surprises is that kids seem to want to build those relationships. And I think it's been very positive, but I think there's also some bumps in the road where you start to think about, and one of the things we'll talk about is, is the system, is what I'm doing in the classroom, is that supporting kids or make, could that even be considered, you know, traumatic, like what we're asking kids to do? And so one of the things I'll talk about in a little bit, too, is the focus we've had on community based learning and community service and how that can be sort of a, a place for uh, healing and experience and also building relationships with kids in a in a really positive way that I would say is non-traditional uh, in terms of in terms of public schools. So 
One of the things, and by the way, I am very much looking forward to the vacation. I think you forget what a long pull it is from August uh, until November, until you get to sort of this week. And uh, it's pretty, it's pretty intense. Um, but the a question uh, for folks today is, prior to and during the pandemic, there's been a theme of trauma-informed instruction and sort of equity-based trauma-informed instruction. And I'm still very much a new learner to this, but Katie, when you think about trauma-based instruction and equity-based trauma-informed inst education, what does that mean to you or how are you thinking about that? Well, you know, I just was re reflecting on what you were just talking about. It's like a both and, right? Like we have to not only try to fix the systems that are often not honoring the humanity of all students, but then we're also um, trying to do it in the smaller level in our own classrooms, you know? So it's, it's, um, it's trying to do both things. Hello. <laughs> um, but, but what it means to me is really like trying to first and foremost shift from the deficit lens of viewing students um, and communities into an asset-based frame and focus. And I know that um, Alex talks a lot about that in her book, and that's really been an important shift for me to make in project-based learning and service learning is not that we're just going to go look at the problems in the schools and the communities, but that we're first going to celebrate what is good and that there is goodness and um, assets and value in every community, in every school, and in every person, um, so that when we're when we're thinking that way, that can really shape all sorts of things um, that are happening in the classroom. Um, so that that's one of the basic pieces of of um, trauma informed is just really what what is going well for the student and how can I um, both connect and build relationship and then also capitalize on that and help the students see um, some of their strengths that they not may not be seeing for themselves. All right, thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to welcome. Uh, Katie Ingraham uh, from Up for Learning. Welcome, Katie. Thanks for joining us. As I was mentioning at the opening, it's a very busy week and people are a little bit sort of all over. Um, but would you mind uh, just introducing yourself and sort of your role at Up for Learning? Yeah, happy to. Hi, everybody. I'm Katie. Uh, I'm a program director at Up for Learning. Uh, happy to be here for the first time. And um, yeah, I do a lot of work with Up for Learning. I primarily am working with our Cultivating Pathways to Sustainability program and also our youth leadership module, but I um, work for equity work across lots of districts in Vermont and um, student voice and leadership uh, in out-of-state partners as well. So yeah, I've been learning a lot and uh, my background is in trauma-informed education and uh, I had my own program at U32 um, middle and high school. So happy to be here. So Katie, I, so full disclosure, I work with uh, Katie as part of, uh, she's helping our leadership group, uh, our MSMS Sustainability Leadership Group, and that's been taking off. It's been awesome. Um, I did not know about that background, and so I want to, uh, I want to rephrase, kind of reframe the first question uh, that we, that we asked, which um, is, you know, there's been a lot of this theme of trauma-informed instruction and uh, equity-based trauma-informed instruction. And as someone who's working with a lot of school, across a lot of schools, so what are you seeing as some of the themes or some of the, the pieces that are working? Katie Farber just mentioned an asset-based lens. Um, I also just, again, wanna mention a lot of what I'm learning is from this Equity Center uh, trauma-informed education book uh, by Alex Chevron Vanette. But uh, Katie, what's your perspective on that? And you know, what are you looking for when you, when you are looking for equity informed, uh, sorry, equity centered trauma informed education? Yeah, I think, I think my answer has changed since working with Up For Learning just because of the product of the fact that I'm in a new role and learning a lot of new things. Um, I, uh, so, I think but like when I was running a program first and for uh, in a middle school, the trauma informed approach would be allowing people to show up as they are um, creating practices for uh, 
for building up students' window of tolerance. It was that term. I feel like I'm in good company with that term. I'm all happy to talk about it more. Um, so really creating like safe spaces in schools, helping people feel uh, like they can um, have someone have a place to go to. They have a place to belong. And I actually see a huge connection between finding a place to belong um, which inevitably ends up being the places that are trauma transformed inside of schools for some of, uh, for a lot of students. And I see the connection between belonging and equity work um, really intricately connected. And I think that a lot of schools actually, as I'm taking the pulse on Vermont as a state um, with a lot of groups focused on equity right now is, is that lens of equity as as belonging, um, as removing barriers. And I think that is what I'm learning the most at the moment is true, true equity work is about removing barriers, but also um, centering belonging for all students. Um, yeah, I could probably keep going. I don't know how long to go with this group or what your no, I mean, processes great, right? for connection are. <laughs> No, I, I think that's a really interesting because you you mentioned a couple of things that I'd like to I'd like to get back to, including this idea of a trauma transformed classroom in particular, and um, I really appreciate that, and also this idea of removing barriers and belonging, uh, which I think are you know essential to creating those strong and healthy relationships. So I really appreciate that. Before we kind of dive into that, I do want to uh, introduce or have uh, another contributor introduce themselves. Joe Rivers, uh, do you want to give a brief introduction? And uh, the question on the table, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, is kind of what are you looking at when you're thinking about equity-centered and trauma-informed education? Um, yeah, welcome, Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Rivers. I work at Brattleboro Area Middle School. And uh, over these last few years, I think I've learned that I need to look at myself first. And uh, I need to be very aware of what I'm doing. Because what I'm doing uh, with the folks that I work with uh, is judgmental every day. <laughs> and puts people in boxes or doesn't put them in boxes, uh, either accepts them or marginalizes them. And so a lot of what I focus on is really uh, my self, <laughs> uh, how, how I am uh, dealing with stress, how I'm dealing with uh, anxiety, how I'm dealing with uh, unforeseen circumstances that pop up uh, during the course of the day. And, and so a lot of the work uh, is internal. Okay. I'll leave it there. Sounds like we're getting some announcements. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. I think just to kind of touch on one thing that Joe said, working on, you know, working on a personal perspective. Um, in, in the book, uh, Chevron Vanette talks about sort of a teacher mindset and how you continue, have to continue to work on a teacher mindset. And I think one of the benefits of both reading the book and also having groups like these is it just tweaks your perspective uh, just enough. And even today, knowing that I was having this conversation and thinking about my mindset sort of as the first level and then the classroom and then the system, you know, I, you have kids who are, who are, for example, showing up late, right? And I had a kid who's, who's, a student who showed up late and we're in the middle of a project and you know your initial reaction you know, why are you showing and then you're like wait a minute i'm just gonna wait it's not a big deal let them come in and they'll probably benefit more from taking part in the activity than me you know whatever and so they come in and sure enough they had a pass they got right into the they got right into the activity with a friend of theirs who i had you know intentionally partnered and I think that's something that, uh, you know, we talked about removing barriers to that belonging and just welcoming, welcoming them into the, into the classroom. And, you know, sometimes uh, for me, it's like you want everything to go smoothly and you want this sort of, we're doing this project and we want everybody to be doing it. And, and instead, that was just one moment 
today where I just lay, laid off a little bit and kind of just let the kid come in. And I think there was a benefit and uh, both for me and for the student, because for me, I realized how important it is to create that welcoming environment, that belonging. And so as Joe, just to kind of echo what Joe said, kind of working on my mindset and then thinking about what that might mean for, you know, for students and how do I check myself before um, I might say something or do something that can alienate a student and, you know, throw up a, a barrier to that belonging. So, you know, those are some very interesting points. And I guess I'd like to just kind of ask that, you know, this question when, if we start with the teacher and the mindset, what, what do folks think would be some characteristics of a teacher who is, you know, some basic nuts and bolts characteristics of a teacher who is sort of trauma informed, but also creating that belonging space. What does that look like, particularly for middle school? And uh, we'll start with Katie Farber and then Meg, if Meg has the chance to join us, uh, Katie, I, and then Joe. Well, um, so interesting just listening to you all and thinking like, everybody in a certain way is saying we need more humanity in these systems. We need kids to be seen as full humans, right? Like, and then Don, when you were saying about the, your mindset with a student coming in late, I've had a similar shift that instead of, um, you know, you've got folks coming in late to your class instead of like, where were you? Or sort of this immediate reaction. It's like, I'm, I, and I do this in my classes now is just, oh, I'm glad to see you. Hey, welcome. Glad you're here. So it's just like, I don't know your story. Like, like some of my students, they're coming from jobs. They're coming from the bus. Like they're literally running to get there. They're, they're hustling. Right. You're, and then if you think about students in your, in the middle school, what, what situation did they just come from? Did, you know, did they just come from the bathroom where there was like something going on in there? Like, it just makes me think like that belongingness back to what Katie's saying is like, is like, I'm glad to see you. I'm glad you're here. You matter. Like you're part of our community and I'm so glad that you're here. <laughs> like, so it just makes me think of that. Um, and then as far as dispositions of the teacher, like being open to feedback from students constantly, like be, you know, asking what they think and like really, really just being like vulnerable with them and saying, you know, oh, I said, I'm sorry. I just said that in a way that I think might, you know, might not have been you know, what I meant to say, or just, just in asking them about, oh, how did that activity go for you? Or is there anything I could have done differently? Like that vulnerability and being open and then our mindset around, yes, what we have to teach is important, but um, holding space for those kids to, to be their full selves and like really building that belongingness out. Um, those are some things I'm just thinking about based on what everybody just said. Awesome. Thank you so much, Meg. I don't know if Meg, I think Meg's going to get back to us shortly. Uh, Katie, I? Yeah. Um, it's a really good question. Um, and I feel like I am, I'm relatively new to my work with Up for Learning. Um, so I kind of am straddling two, two, two worlds in this moment um, with this question. And I think my most profound learning about being trauma-informed in my last year of being in a school every day um, was how important boundaries are actually like first and foremost in a trauma informed space. I think when I started a program, I kind of went with like, Oh, everybody should feel like they can share everything with me. And that's actually not healthy or helpful. I learned. So boundaries um, are critical. Um, knowing the difference between the teacher role and the counselor role um, and clarifying that both for um, myself as an educator and for um, for students, I think is really important. So being very clear about boundaries, being very clear about roles um, inevitably helps create a more trauma transformed space. And, um, and through that lens, like, doesn't mean that they can't share. It just means like, oh, this sounds like something that really would be a great thing to talk to your counselor about. Let's build resources. So connections with resources too, as the primary role of educator, teacher in trauma-transformed spaces. And um, 
boundaries with like expectations and rigor too. And then I think boundaries with self. So first and foremost, like identifying ways that, um, especially through the equity lens that like white supremacy culture characteristics show up in my practice. Um, and I have a great resource if that would be helpful, but, um, how white supremacy characteristics are showing up in my, in my teaching practice, my leadership practice, um, and in my interactions with students and how to like combat those daily in the moment or, or through a reflection process after, um, I think those have been the most profound learnings for me, um, to this question. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Joe. I would suggest that uh, predictability and consistency are really important, more important than previous experiences I've had as a teacher. You know, in the last few years, uh, I've changed the way I go about things because not because it's something I want to do necessarily. I like the unpredictability of going day to day and reacting to students in the moment, but that's not what they're asking for right now. <laughs> they're asking for uh, predictability, consistency, uh, a lot of uh, planned time on my part uh, beforehand so that when they come in, I'm relaxed and they can be relaxed and we can work together. And so, it, it, things are different and, uh, or I'm acknowledging that things are different. Maybe they have been for a while, <laughs> but I've, I've had to, um, and chosen to change and be, try to be more predictable, more consistent. Uh, I've tried to promote and acknowledge competence when I see it uh, and to uh, kind of champion that when, when someone does something well, and it's real. I'm not giving out awards for, um, you know, everything. But when someone does something that really demonstrates development and growth in the skills that we're working on, whether they're uh, academic skills or behavioral skills, then I'm quick to to acknowledge that and to say, all right, we're moving, and we're moving in the way we want to be moving. And uh, I think there's been such uncertainty in the last few years that uh, we all need that. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter how old you are. I, I think we all need that in the settings that we're in. And, and so those are the things I'm trying to, uh, trying to promote uh, in what's going on now. Thanks for that, Joe. I'm, you know, I, I appreciate how you talked about uh, promoting and acknowledging uh, competence and um, this that one statement about the uncertainty in the last few years I think is really spot on and I just from I've changed my role pretty much completely from a humanities teacher to now a project-based learning sustainability teacher and so for example today we and yesterday we were baking bread as part of the King Arthur Bake for Good program. And then that bread was donated to the Montpelier Food Pantry. And so it's a what's amazing to me is it's not amazing. I kind of knew it, but I'm seeing it now is that when you have projects that kids are invested in or interested in, a lot of the other stuff goes away, like the behavior and the um, they want to be up, they want to be moving, they want to be working together. And what's been particularly gratifying is seeing kids who I had as sixth graders last year, who in a tr more traditional type classroom, where there were some chal challenges, challenging behavior and whatnot. And those same kids this year are like washing and cleaning in the kitchen and they're doing that as extra and they're asking kids, can I, can I do some, what else can I do to help? And as you mentioned, Joe, acknowledging that sort of no matter what it's in, but acknowledging that. And I think that that is another way of removing those barriers to belonging is saying that you are 
you're doing a great job and it's not based on academics. It's not based on proficiency. It's based on the fact that you're lending a hand and helping out. And that can be in so many different ways. And I think that has been a real, a revelation for me is to see kids who you might, you know, traditionally in the past say, Oh, this is, you know, this might be a challenge. Well, if you let them go and you give them that direction, I think that they can really, it's been very, very gratifying. One of the things, Joe, I just want to go back real quick. You said planned time. Does that mean that you're spending more time planning so that you can be more relaxed in the classroom or what, it, what exactly does that signify? Yes, I've, I've changed my uh, schedule <laughs> so that uh, I show up at the same time every day, no matter what the school's saying. Uh, about when I'm supposed to be here, but I get here at the same time, try to set a routine for myself, and I set time aside so that uh, I, I just do stuff I didn't used to worry about. You know, I, I make sure that everything's lined up the way it's supposed to be lined up in the room and that um, things are neater than they used to be and it's less cluttered and, and that uh, there's space that students know where to go in order to find particular, just, um, spending more time on the space you know katie talked about that earlier about how space can be seen as welcoming or it can be seen as uh causing stress and so i've tried to be more mindful of that and in order to do that i need to be here <laughs> to, to do it so uh and so i just it's more time don quick answer is it's more time here in the building in my space, the space that I share with the young people every day and making that uh, me spending more time causes me to reflect more on how it's perceived by the folks who come in here every day. All right, thank you very much. So again, if the trajectory of the conversation is, is sort of to start with the teacher and maybe we talked a little bit about the space, but then the next I guess step up would be sort of the system or school policies. And I guess I would just ask for a perspective, you know, maybe what's one policy that you see as potentially causing trauma or causing stress, as Joe just mentioned, and what might be something that you can do to, to sort of impact that system or to make your space more welcoming. So now I'd like to just kind of start focusing on just a, a few of the things or strategies that or recommendations that teachers could say, hey, maybe I should reflect on this policy or this area and how could I do it differently to get a different result? Uh, Katie Farber, what do you think about that? Well, I'm having just a lot of a lot of um, reflecting on the last two years of teaching in public school and thinking like like flexible seating, you know, people going where they need to go based on how they're arriving comes to mind, like those really soft starts where like it, it, and some something I think Katie said earlier really made me think of like when we're reacting to the situation as it's unfolding and having flexibility around that. So like. Um, I'm just thinking about the beginning of the school day, you know, is it a wildlife cam to spark joy with like a panda that's climbing a bamboo tree, like, because everybody seems a little glum or is it an ocean scene with that calming ocean sound because everybody's coming back from PE and they're really wound up and need some grounding or, or from recess, maybe there was some arguing or whatever, like, um, how are we, you know, those are more classroom practices and not policies. So let me try to think more about what you're saying with policies. Um, certainly, um, you know, bathrooms that people feel comfortable using in the school, like those are, that's a really sort of low hanging fruit change that can make our students feel um, a policy change that can make students feel really welcome. So making sure that there are things like, um, you know, menstrual products in every bathroom, regardless of gender, um, like just, and, and free, <laughs> you know, like these things, policies that are removing barriers. Those are a couple that come to mind right away. Um, and then thinking about policies around 
what trauma has happened based on what. So it's really easy in public school systems to not address like racialized trauma or gender-based trauma that comes up and to just like simply solve it. But what you haven't solved is the ongoing like ramifications to a relationship in a family or a child. Um, How do you have a restorative response to harm that's embedded in the system that can then try to heal um, the relationships and heal the community. So there's some things I'm thinking about um, as policy shifts. I'm gonna have to think a little bit more um, for some more ideas. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Meg, are you there? I, I am, Don. Thank you so much for uh, being patient. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, did you hear the question? I did. I did hear it about sort of uh, what are some, do you want to rephrase it just or say it again? Just Yeah, no, what are some, uh, you know, policies and, and systems that we have in place that might actually be, you know, causing stress or causing trauma for kids or um, as Katie Ingraham said earlier, actually creating barriers to belonging uh, or creating places and situations where kids are more stressed than relaxed and and comfortable. And I just, you know, um, Katie Farber mentioned like bathroom policies. I'm thinking about transitions, you know, between classrooms. I'm thinking about late policies yeah. and homework policies, et cetera. So things like that. What's your opinion? Yeah, I think um, something that we see currently is, um, you know, our kids need breaks, they need movement breaks. And we're seeing that um, uh, there are some adults in our building who sometimes feel like they're, uh, the kids aren't where they're supposed to be. And they're, um, and you know, uh, it's disruptive. And we're trying to say, hey, let's give them some autonomy and some flexibility about what they need during the day. Um, we're a K-8 building and so on the one hand, you know, the seventh and eighth grade teachers are trying to be responsive to kids' needs about movement. And then, on the, uh, and so they also then tend to travel through the building uh, in, in big ways and take up a lot of space. And that sometimes can really intimidate younger kids. So we're trying to figure out how do we live in this K-8 community and uh, take responsibility for, uh, for our, our movement and our actions um, and also allow for uh, our middle schoolers to have some, some autonomy and flexibility. And so it's just been this interesting dance of trying to uh, trying to figure that out. So our administration is, um, there was this conversation about, let's talk to the little kids about what it might feel like so that we can give the big kids some perspective. This is what it feels like when you walk through the hallways, when you're, when you're really loud and playing with your friends and, um, or talking really loudly. And, um, and we just want to, you know, I think taking an opportunity to see those perspectives might also help some of the teachers who tend to think that uh, the big kids are being problems or are problematic and to just help them maybe see what we need. So I think it'll be interesting to see if there's something that could come out of this sort of interviewing, capturing perspectives of, um, of impact. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Katie, I? Yeah, I, again, I'm thinking about this from two lenses. The first is, uh, I, I think I would echo what folks were saying about transition time. And just, um, I, I felt like when I was in schools, I often combated that policy by creating the excuse. <laughs> like I had a role where I could be the excuse for a lot of students to give them that space. Um, so just kind of combating it with my own practice um, to create that space for people. But I think the thing I'm thinking about 
at the moment um, in my current role is about like, a, we talk a lot about equity policies that are actually being created um, in a lot of different schools across the state and, and nation. And um, these equity policies, sometimes the language is really inaccessible to students. <laughs> Often these equity policies are not necessarily even created in collaboration with students. So um, looking at the practice and procedure for creating these policies first and foremost, and then projects designed to make these actually actionable um, po equity policies. So, I mean, all policies are kind of uh, just floating out there. So I think the work that I've been doing is really, really honing in on how to, how can youth and adults create an actionable equity policy because equity is an action word, um, in my opinion. So that can look like a lot of different things. I think through when I was teaching, I focused a lot on taking that equity policy towards curriculum redesign, um, in the humanities. And, um, that was pretty effective and felt really, um, it felt really powerful and it felt really relevant. And, um, I think the students enjoyed it. So I think curricular redesign, um, through an equity policy as an actionable project, there's lots of other actionable projects like bathrooms and gender equity and stuff too, but that's one. And, um, I think something that's often forgotten with equity policies too is how it connects to special education services. Uh, I think we go very, very f um, rightfully into racial and gender inequities, but um, often can fail to consider in equity policies, um, special education services. All right. Thank you. And thank you for adding that too. I, I don't think, I think that's a unique, not a unique, it's a unique perspective that probably shouldn't be. I appreciate that. Joe Rivers? That's a good lead into what I was going to talk about a little bit. Uh, Act 173 is, you know, the, the idea behind it was to level the playing field and make access to uh, services um, less onerous. But uh, it hasn't played out that way yet. And, and so I'm not sure why, except, you know, it's one of those things where um, was the mechanism to evaluate and move the move the goalposts to, to a different place where, where things are more equitable, where there is more access to services. Uh, ESSER funds have certainly created many new positions in our districts, and and those funds have brought in uh, social workers, and they they've brought in. Um, lots of coaches and, and helpers in different ways, which are needed, but uh, the gates to gain access to, to those things still seem to be pretty high. And, you know, through the MTSS model, uh, through, uh, you know, the paperwork that's, that needs to be done in order to move a student that you see in real need in real time. And, uh, and then you look at, all right, how much time is it going to take to get there to where we can get access to the supports that seem pretty apparent that, that are needed? Uh, that hasn't really changed. So that's a policy that I, you know, as far as policy goes, uh, I'd really like to see that. We don't function at the human scale. It, our school, what was really cool about Vermont it, is that we've kept our districts manageable, but it, but even so, we, we've done that. Our schools are not that big. Uh, the classrooms are not that full. But even though we should be able to do better, we, we still see, I feel like we have gates that uh, deny access for uh, students because they don't have the appropriate label. And that goes to KDI's point. Um, and sometimes we said we shouldn't label kids, but all right, we don't, we shouldn't, you're right. So why, why do we have to label them then in order to have them gain access to supports that are readily, you know, there, there's a real need for them. So that's just, that's a policy that doesn't seem to change quickly enough. And the other thing is, is just um, scheduling. Uh, we, we just went right back to uh, probably many places went right back to the old schedule again. And, uh, or 
some version of the old schedule without a lot of conversation or examination of how we could change uh, and should change maybe in order to meet the needs of students. We, we're not having that conversation. And that's something that's driven by policy and um, structure. All right, thank you very much. Um, those are some really, you know, larger scale system wide policies, which uh, is reflective of the, the question. But, you know, somebody mentioned flexible seating. And this year for the I this is amazing to me, but for the first year kids come in when I get a new group of kids by quarter, they come in and they sit down where they want to sit down. And I just say, that's that's fine. Right. And I'm not like I'm not you're going to sit here and you're going to sit here. And this is what I thought of you last year. So you're going to sit apart. I'm just you sit where you want to sit. That's fine. Right. And it turns out that they sit with people they want to sit with. And it makes it makes my grouping so much easier because I just say there's probably sitting with three or four kids they want to sit with. I'll just put them in a group and we'll go do our project. And the feedback I've gotten has been, boy, these groups are really good, Mr. Taylor. Can we have the same group next time? And so it's one of those things where I used to have this, oh, I have to be organized and do this. And, and in fact, um, you know, there's still some challenges, but for the most part, it seems to be working pretty well. And that's just a policy where if a kid knows that they can come in and sit with someone they're comfortable with, that probably is going to make them more, I mean, you know, it's just going to make them more willing to maybe listen. And so, and I just tell them, you're going to sit there as long as you can sit there. And if you can, you know, and I just think it's worked out so much better and it, it removes conflict because one thing I might do is sit a kid next to another kid who has been going at it for the, you know, the last two periods, but that's out of my realm and I don't know that. So that's just sort of one thing. The other piece uh, I, that was mentioned was this idea of student voice. And it's still amazing to me. We've mentioned feedback several times and Meg talked about getting the perspectives of young students. And it's still amazing to me how many decisions we're making without student voice and not and that's something I'm working on with Katie uh, from Up for Learning is how do we make that an actionable piece that should be included in all the decisions that we are, are making as educators. And I think that also even student voice for me is also about having co hard conversations. I, I think I've mentioned this before. We've had conversations in my classroom talking about racial incidents and this quote really stood out for me. It was, Mr. Taylor, our teachers treat racism as something that's happening somewhere else. And it's happening here. And asking them where, you know, where are you talking about this? And students not having a place where they can talk about it or figure it out, that's safe. And so I think that's also this idea, are all the kids getting the opportunity to talk about their perspectives and from a couple conversations ago, Katie Farber mentioned, if we're not talking about that, there's a culture of silence that can also impact and induce, I think, trauma and stress among kids. And that's something I think about a lot. And then just a nuts and bolts thing is what, you know, are we conducting equity audits on a regular basis on our curriculum, on the books, on what our classrooms, Joe talked about his, his space you know, is our space welcoming for all genders, all races, all, all the kids who are walking to our classrooms? And so that's just, you know, something, you know, I, I think about quite a bit. Um, we're getting towards the end here. And I just want to ask sort of one, one last question. And that is, you know, it's easy when you start talking about uh, trauma-informed education, it's easy to focus on some of, the, some of the negative things or this needs to be changed or that needs to be changed. Um, but I also want to talk about this idea of healing and this idea of building relationships. And I guess just a final question is, what are people doing or recommending or seeing that is causing really good things to happen and is empowering kids and is perhaps, um, as Joe mentioned, allowing kids to kind of feel comfortable and get back to this place where they can be kids in a really positive and supportive learning environment. 
So again, just what are you seeing that's assisting or supporting um, or creating those healing spaces for kids? Uh, and we'll just leave it at that. Katie Farber? So many things. These conversations always fill my brain with so many thoughts. Um, so I just have to say one thing that, you know, of course, I couldn't really think of any policies. And then I thought of all of them after my turn came and went. But um, I was thinking about the homework policy, um, just really interrogating, like, is this a necessary thing to be doing? Because I really noticed a huge shift in um, the happiness and wellness and um, just... Yeah, just more more time to be a kid um, when we really reduce the amount of homework um, that that was being given. Um, just as a as a whole system, actually, we did we did a whole research study. So, so just circling back to that, but um, but yeah, so I feel like um, you're sort of crafting and designing this learning space, right? Where where we're inviting everybody to be their full selves and allowing for them to be that. Um, with flexibility as much as we can across multiple landscapes, right? And, and situations. So there's that. Um, and what, what does that look like? Like you have a student who maybe who presents with intense math anxiety, like, and, and just the idea of seeing a problem that she doesn't, or he doesn't, or they don't know how to tackle is really overwhelming. So how can you use everybody in that building to help like if somebody has ex, a 10, 10 extra minutes, there's an adult and it might not be the teacher. In this case, um, we had one of the math coaches who had 10 extra minutes and she would preview some of that learning, just even do a problem that was similar or even a drawing that was around the concept that was going to be presented so that that student would walk into the class with more confidence and less anxiety and then wouldn't melt down in the class. It was just like removing a barrier. It was just a simple routine um, and that gave her access to her math learning. Another way to think about it is, is in, in, um, Katie was talking about special education it really made me think of how can we frame our special educators and all teachers as learning maximizers, no matter who has a plan or not, or who has, and that's a term that Erica Saunders um, out of slams in Philadelphia really turned me on to because she, she showed me her cape and, and, you know, I, I know there's a lot wrong with like the superhero trope with teachers, but she really felt like she called herself a learning maximizer for all students. And I feel like that is taking stigma away. And that is just that everybody is in the building to help support all students. So those are a few things on my mind about that. Thank you so much. Um, Meg? Yeah, I, um, well, I'm just coming off the of parent conferences, and, student-led conferences, and um, just, so I don't know if this is directly related to that, but gosh, I love that time with families to see all the things that, um, you know, that kids are, with their hopes and dreams and what they want to focus on. And then I get excited about the goals that they set. It provides me an opportunity to bring that into the classroom. So if there's a student that's a tinkerer, then I want to make sure that we're doing something like that. And then, uh, I have some students who are really interested in unified sports. So we want to make sure that happens. And then another kid wants to get uh, all about the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the, um, when you jump in the lake in February? I forget, I'm forgetting the what it penguin is. Penguin plunge. Uh, penguin plunge. And so I teared up about seeing a whole child and uh, getting that that one-on-one -on -one time and, and then just being reminded that I need to bring these opportunities uh, into the classroom for one another. Thanks. Thank you, Meg. Uh, Katie, I? Yeah. Um, yeah, so many things being done towards healing. I do love it when there's more mental health supports in schools, like Joe mentioned, just like more funding for um, social workers and counselors. But I think healing like collectively is interesting. So like students organizing around themselves through clubs, through activism, through um, friendships, right? Like ident identifying the folks in your in your class spaces that make you feel good and 
going and feeling and following the things that make you feel good. Um, that includes like passion-based education, I think too, um, either through projects or through, um, career centers, like anything that kind of fills passion and purpose, um, inevitably leads towards healing. Thank you, Joe. Uh, a passionate advisory program, uh, a real one. One, one that uh, where you have time every day to meet with the same folks for the whole time that they're with you in the building that you're in. So for us, that's just two years, but we, we get to have the same group of young people for those two years and build real relationships and have real experiences together and support one another. Uh, it's the the part of the day that I look forward to the most, uh, really, it's a great way to start. And I don't think it's enough a part of uh, middle grades practices as it should be. We talk about it a lot, but then we don't structure our lives so that it takes on the meaning that it could. All right. Uh, I would just say the one thing that's been the most um, important thing for me has been moving to this fully project-based uh, curriculum. And uh, we just recently had a student from our leadership team who helped co-create a volunteer program. And this week we took our first four student eighth grade volunteers to the food pantry for an hour each. And that was remarkable. Uh, working with kids in the community and seeing them recognize uh, the needs of the community and knowing that they're making a difference. And we're gonna have all the eighth graders do at least one hour of volunteering per quarter. And um, Katie Farber had mentioned before this idea of universal access to food. Food is a great healer. And we're finding that um, talking about it and working with it and helping um, the community to gain access to that is really giving a lot of meaning to our students. So I know that folks need to get going uh, and I want to wish everybody a very, very well-deserved break over uh, Thanksgiving. I also just want to mention that the Middle Grades Conference is happening January 21st from 9 to 2 at the University of Vermont and the Middle Grade Institute is also open for enrollment. Uh, and that's happening, I think, June 26th through July 1st. So again, thank you to all our contributors. I hope you get to spend time with your loved ones and family. I really appreciate all that you bring every month. We'll see you. Our next uh, discussion is December 15th on Thursday, and we will see you then. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon and a happy Thanksgiving. Bye now. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Thank you.